and it's time consuming, but it is worthwhile, is to sit down, look at these, click on the little button next to each of them and it opens up that menu. And when you click on a report name, over to the right, a sample for that report shows up. I don't expect anybody to be able to look at what I'm looking at right now and know what that is, but if you click on it, it brings up a full-size version of that sample. So this is what the family quick listing report looks like. It's gonna have the envelope number, the name, the address, and the phone number. If I click on the family roster, I'm gonna see what the family roster report looks like. It's gonna have the ID number, the name, the address, the email addresses, and member information on it. So have an idea of what reports are already available in the program, and when six months from now, father says to you, hey, I need to get a list out, it's gonna have the families on it, it's gonna have their members on it, and their ages. You might not remember the exact report, but you're gonna know, hey, I remember I saw a report in there that already does that. And you're not trying to start from scratch and build your own when there's already something there that can do that. So having an idea of what's in the program makes it a lot easier when you're going to run these down the road. So I'd suggest taking some time to look through the reports that are in here and click on the samples of them just so you have an idea of what's available to you. So we picked the type of information that we want. We want family information. We're going to pick the style of information that we want. So for me, I'm going to say I want that family quick listing. Once I've picked what report I'm going to run, then I'm going to start in the beginning with picking what I want on the report. And the very last step I'm going to get to is who is showing up on the report. This what versus who is always tricky. What we're doing when we're creating a report is we're creating a layout for the report and then picking who we want to show up on that layout. So everything that I've done so far is just determining what that report is going to look like. It's gonna have a column that has the ID number, a column that has the name, a column that has the address, and a column that has the phone number. The last step that I do is gonna determine which families show up on that report. So that's the who part that we're talking about. I can take the same what, that same family quick listing, and run it for all different kinds of groups of families. So I could run it for my families who are new in the parish. I can run it for my families who don't have an email address filled in. I can run it for my families who have a member that's eligible for school. I can reuse that same what with lots of different who's. The same way I can take my same list of who's and print a list of them, I can print labels for them, and then I can print a letter for them. So we can mix and, mix and match those two things. We just want to make sure that we remember what the difference is between the what and the who. So I'm going to tell us when we're doing a what thing and then tell us when we're doing a who thing. So if I start saying this is a who thing, you know what I'm talking about. So we picked the what so far. We're going to do family data, we're going to do a listing report, and we're going to do the family quick listing. When I click next, the first screen that I'm going to see is this overview screen. And this is something they added in with version six of the program. And what it does is it shows me all the choices that were made the last time this report was run. And that was the last time the report was run on this machine. So if you're working with multiple workstations at your site, it's gonna remember the overview screen separately for each different workstation. Because some people might be working with you know, school families a lot, and somebody else might be working with uh, religious ed families a lot and so they might be looking for different things when they run the same report and that way you don't have to keep changing things back and forth between them. So this is showing me the printers that were used the last time, the layouts that were used the last time, and the sort order that was used the last time. If everything here is correct, I could jump right to previewing it or printing it if I wanted to. I certainly don't have to but I can if I want to. I'm going to click next and it's going to take me to my printer information. This is where I can choose the printer that I want to use. It's going to default to your Windows default printer, although you can certainly drop that down and change it. When I click Next, it's going to take me to my layout screen. So this layout screen is going to allow me to choose some more things of that what, so what this report is going to look like. I can set a base font. I can choose page style options. I can choose options about unlisted phone numbers or email addresses and I can choose margin style information as well. So I have lots of different choices about how I want this information to look. These are gonna be standard selections. It's gonna to default to what it thinks are the most standard options when you run through it, but you're always welcome to change that information as well. When I click the next button, 
this is where I'm getting to my who information. This is gonna be who I want to show up on the report. So it's my select the family screen up here at the top. It's where I can choose which families I want to be displayed. The default for every family report is to include all active families and to sort them by ID number. I can change that to get less families. I can change that to include my inactive and get more families. And I can adjust that sort order over here as well. So it just depends on what it is that we're looking for. And we're gonna get into those selections um, when we get to page two of our reports today. Can you change uh, the sort order default? Let me check. If I do it by name and I hit preview, and it comes up and I close and I come back through the next time, no, it's gonna keep defaulting back to ID number. I know, that's really annoying, isn't that? Yeah. yeah. Formation defaults to sort by name. School defaults to sort by name. Church defaults to sort by ID number. It would be another great option for that um, enhancement request thing to say, can you make the default sort order to be name? Which would be really nice. Um, so when we're coming through here, that's the difference between that what and the who. Those first steps all the way up to here determining what the report's going to look like. And this last part here is determining who is going to print onto it. So when we're looking at our list of reports, there are all of these standard reports built into the program. There's 150, 200 some standard reports that come with it. One of the big questions that we get asked is what if it doesn't do what I want it to do? So I have this family quick listing, it has the ID number, it has the name, the address, and the phone number. I really don't care about the phone number, I do care about the email address. What can I do about that? Well, we have two different ways that we can modify them. Any standard report can be copied and modified. We can't modify the original, but we can copy and modify that copy. They do that so that if you mess up when you're changing the report, you always have your original to go back to. So that way you can't do any permanent damage to the reports in the program. And that way you can make as many different modifications as you want, and if somebody else liked the report the way that it was, we haven't ruined anything for them. So whenever I click on a report, down at the bottom of the screen is this copy button. If I were to run the family quick listing, I'm just gonna pull it up to that listing layout screen. This modify button is grayed out, I can't click on it. But once I've made a copy, and I go back to that same screen, that report or that button's not grayed out anymore. So I, once I've copied it, I've unlocked it, and then I can go in and make whatever changes I want to it. When I copy a report, there's two different kind of reports that you can copy. The family quick listing report is what we would call a simple report. So when I click on this modify the list of fields to print, I get here's the fields you're printing, and here's every other field on the program. Pick what you want, get rid of what you don't want. It's pretty basic. So I can say I don't want this phone list, but I do want the email address. And just like that, I've gotten rid of the phone number, I've added the email address, and everything is right with the world. So I'd have my ID number, my name, my address, and my email, so if this data had emails filled in, which it looks like they don't. There's one, yay! Uh, so we're able to modify fairly easily with those simple reports picking and choosing what I want and what I don't want. Some of the reports in the program are much more complex. So for example, if I copy the family roster report, I can still modify it, but when I go into modify, it's gonna take me into the advanced report writer. And so this is what's called a three-banded report writer. The great thing is that it's here. The not so great thing is, is that it's very complex. Uh, so it's something that not everybody's gonna be able to come in and use. But, but, you can call me and you can say, this report is great, except for I need it to do this, this, and that. And I will say, send me a sample of what you want it to look like. And you will send me that sample and then I will send you up the report files for what you're looking for. <coughs> we are happy to do that. All we need for you to do is tell us what you want it to look like. If you call me and you say, I want a registration report, then I will say, what do you want it to look like? And if you can't tell me what you want it to look like, can't give you a registration report. But if you can say, I want it to look like this, we are happy to do that for you. 
So all we need is the sample of what you want, and we can use this report writer to give it to you. All of that is covered underneath of the diocese. You don't need to pay us anything for that. We are happy to do that for you. So it's just a matter of being able to say that. But because you copied your original report, in order to modify it, you can feel free to come into this and play around with it to your heart's content and know that you can't break anything. So the worst that happens is you break the copy of your report. Your original is always there. You can always recopy it again to go and see what you want to do with it. So it's something that maybe it's just changing one field. Maybe it's getting rid of one field. It's pretty easy to kind of bluff your way through that. The other thing is, if you come up under user guides, you will see that there's actually an advanced report guide built into it, which gives you a basic tutorial on the advanced report writer. So if any of you are feeling, feeling optimistic um, and are feeling like you want a challenge, go ahead and go through that. It has some really great examples for kind of starting from the ground up and building a report. It can get you familiar with that report writer if you would ever want to play with anything inside of there. So we can copy any report that we have in the program and we can modify the copy. We can also start from scratch and create our own reports. So if you think about baking a cake, when I go to bake a cake, I can either get a box mix from the grocery store and use my box mix. And I'm gonna get a pretty standard yellow cake or whatever kind of cake mix I've picked. I could also break out, the, break out the flour and the sugar and the eggs and bake a cake from scratch. I'm not normally going to do that because the other one is easier, but I can do that when I need to. We also have an add button at the bottom that's the same thing. Copying, think about it like you're baking a cake from a box mix. I'm taking something that someone else has already started and adding a couple things to it. When I'm doing a cake from scratch, I'm using this add button to get started. So when I hit add down here at the bottom, it's going to say what type of report would you like to add? And I can create my own list, my own letter, my own label, my own envelope, form, export, or a custom report. A custom report would be where you had called me and said, this is what I want the report to look like, and I've emailed you up the report files. That's pulling in a custom report. But all the rest of these are fairly self-explanatory. So we can make our own list or letter or labels or exports to do whatever it is that we're looking for. Right now I'm on my simple report tab, which means we're creating those simple reports where we're gonna pick and choose which fields we want. I have a tab here for advanced reports, which would let me create one of those advanced report writer reports as well. Which again, you're more than welcome to do, but don't feel bad if you can't. So we have these simple ones here. Uh, so when we're going to pick reports that we wanna do things with, what's the best way to do that? Again, it comes down to having an idea of what reports are already in the program. The ones close to the top tend to be the most basic ones. So our family quick listing, our member quick listing, our one-line family list with fund totals are all right up at the top of those sections, and those are all very basic, simple reports. If I click Next, when I look down through my screen, maybe go two more screens, if it says modify the list of fields to print, it's a simple list. If it says modify the report, it's an advanced report. So modify the list always means it's a simple list. Modify the report always means it's built off of the advanced report writer and it's gonna have that advanced report writer go in and change it. So if I wanna modify my list, what's something that we might want on a list? Somebody yell something out. Name. What else would we want besides a name? Age of the children. Okay. What else? One more thing. Give me one more thing. Second ID. The second ID number? Okay. So I want their name, their second ID number, and the names and ages of their kids. So I want a family report in order to do that. So I'm going to be in my family report section. And I want to take a look and see if there's already something that gives me a little bit of what I'm looking for. My family roster report is gonna have the names and ages of my kids on it already, but it's kind of lengthy. So maybe that's not the report that I'm going to wanna to use for it. My family quick listing is gonna have names and ID numbers, but it doesn't have any of the member information on it. But we're gonna take that one as our starting place. So I'm gonna hit my copy button down at the bottom. I'm gonna hit next. And I'm gonna click on modify the list of fields to print. Clicking on it here, or on this screen is exactly the same. 
doesn't matter which one I click on. So I have my ID number, my name, my address, and my phone list. I can take my ID number and I can click and drag it to the left to get rid of it, or I could have hit this little button to get rid of it. And I'm gonna come down and find my second ID number and double click on it to add it. So then I can click here and just drag it up to the top. So first thing is my second ID number. Then I have the family's name, I have their address and their phone list. So now we're gonna look for some member information. So I have my family detail section. I'm gonna come down to my member detail section because the ages are in that member section, not in the family. And I can pick the, the member's first name, and then I can either pick their age or their date of birth. Their age is gonna show me their actual age number based off of today. Their date of birth would show me their actual date of birth. So it just depends on if you wanna do math or not. I'm gonna say age, and I'm gonna say save, and I'm gonna say next, and preview. And now here's my report. I don't have second ID numbers filled in my data, which is why that column's empty. But then here's the Bennett family and their address. Then there's Stephen, who's 41, and Kristen, who's 37, Brianna's 14, Ian's 8, and James is 7. And I can see them coming down through my list here. So I've been able to just add those in and pull it up on here. Maybe I look at this and I say, well, you know, that address is kind of long. I don't know that I really need that. That first name field is really wide. Maybe I don't want it quite as wide on that. And I really wanted to say something else on the left. And I want a blank column in there. When I come back, when I come in to modify the list, anything over here on the right, when I highlight it, I have some options down here at the bottom. So when I click on first name, I can click it and change my heading. So maybe I don't want it to say them, I just want it to say first name. And right now it has a width of 40, which is roughly, it's a weird measurement. So say I had five fields and each of them was set at 20, they'd be each taking up about 20% of the report. But it doesn't add up to 100, it adds up to whatever you fill in. So maybe you're dividing it by 200. Um, so it's kind of a weird thing, but think about it basically as a character width. So you're taking up basically 40 character widths. So maybe I'm gonna drop this down to 30. And if I want a blank field, underneath of the FAM section, there are actually five fields in here called FAM blank one, blank two, blank three, blank four, and blank five. So I can double click on the blank field, and then under heading, I can give it a thing, and maybe I'm gonna say school. And I'm gonna make the width 15. I can hit save and preview. And now I have my report with that blank over here. My name field is a little bit smaller, and I still have my age there. So maybe I'm gonna make a sign out sheet. So I wanna have the kid's name listed, and then a spot for a parent to put a signature. So I can add a blank field in to do that. Or maybe we're gonna have a report at the back of church for people to add their email addresses. So I'm gonna print out that family name, ID number, and a blank column for them to fill something in. So we can always add, using that blank field, anything into that list that we were looking for. If I was gonna do that with adding as opposed to copying, the only difference is that I'm gonna start by hitting the add button at the bottom and I'm gonna to have to pick every field as opposed to having some fields already in there to start from. One thing that I didn't mention, and you can see I have a couple reports down here that are called copies of things. Mm -hmm. Whenever you add a report or copy a report, always, always, always change the name. So I have my copy my family quick listing. When I come to this overview screen, I can click edit and change the name of this. And I can say that this is my fam list with member and blank, whatever I wanna call it. So that, that way when I look back at my list of reports, I know what that one is. Otherwise, you end up with like 30 new list reports and 20 copies of the family quick listing and no idea which one is which. If you've started one and you've abandoned it and it's not good, click on it and click delete and take it back out of there again so that that way you're not having to remember which one of these is the good version of that report and which one is the one that I started but never finished. We see 
so many ridiculous easy report sections that are like pages and pages long, and no one has any idea what two thirds of the reports are, and they have to keep remembering and trying the other third to figure out if it's the good version or the bad version. So it saves it automatically. It saves it automatically, okay. but it's going to save it as the copy uh, with that name. You just have to remember to rename it or fill that description in, just so you have an idea of what it is going forward. But anytime you add or copy, it's always going to go into this easy report section down here at the bottom. So if I wanted to do this as an add as opposed to a copy, I'm going to hit my add button at the bottom. I'm going to choose list. I'm going to say I want to add a list as opposed to adding something else. And it's going to take me right to the list of fields that I want to pull in. So I can go into my family section and say that I wanted that second ID number. And these are all alphabetical. Then I want the name. Then I wanted the address block. The address block, by the way, includes address line one, address line two, city, state, and zip, all in one field, so that you don't have to pull over each one of those separately and take up more width. It stacks them so it takes up less space across the paper. And then I wanted was the member first name and age. Age, and if I wanted that blank, blank one, remember to change my heading and change my width. And save. And again, it's been called new list report, so I would be wise here to go ahead and change the name of this so I remember which this is. I'm not going to do that right now. And I'm going to hit preview, and there's my same report. So my reports come out pretty much looking exactly the same. The difference is with the copying, I had to get rid of one field and add three. When I added, I had to add all five. So it just depends which way you want to do that. If there's something that already has the base of what you're looking for, copying is the easier way to go. If there's something that doesn't really match up with what you want to do at all, adding is the easier way to go. So it just depends on what you're looking to get on that final report, but you can get something similar from either option. When we're talking about letters as opposed to lists. So if I look at my family letter section, I only have two or three, four that are in here that are basic. Uh, I think the formation program has like three of them and the school might have three or four as well. So I usually have lots of different letters that I would want to send. I'm not always going to use the family welcome letter or the anniversary letter or the quick communication permission form. If it was the welcome letter and I wanted to modify it, I don't actually need to copy it first. With a letter report, when I come through, I have the option of modifying the body of the letter. It's not grayed out. The reason is that when I come in here, in the lower left-hand corner, there's a button that says Reload Default Text. And if I click on this, you can see this is some weird text in here. If I click on this, it's going to pop it right back to the way it was when the program was installed. So labels and letters have this reload default text option in the lower left-hand corner. So if somebody comes in to change the text, you can always put it back the way that it was. The reason you would want to make a copy of that, uh, for example, there's a financial statement that's called charges and payments with return coupon. It's like our most popular billing statement in the program. That same report could get used for tuition, for a capital campaign, for religious ed tuition, and for after school billing. You might be using that same report four different ways, and instead of having to change the text in it for each different time you're sending it, you might make a copy and call it school tuition bill, and then no one else is going to mess with it and try to change the text for you. So it's a way of just being able to go in and adjust the things without having to uh, keep changing them back and forth. So I've come in and I'm on my letter. I've come into the body of my letter. I can type in here whatever I want. I can copy and paste into here. So if Father emails me text for a letter and says, here's what I want you to say, I can copy it and paste it right into the body of my letter. Uh, it has spell check built into it, so it's going to check the things just like Word would. It would be highlighted in red if it's not spelled correctly or if it thinks it's not spelled correctly. We can also mail merge information in it. If you notice up here at the top, I have insert field, insert list, or insert other. This allows me to add in other information to my letter. So for example, 
I'm going to show you one that we did in formation. I'm the children's ministry director at my church, and we use formation. Well, technically, the church uses something else. I use formation because I can't use what the church uses because it doesn't let me do what I need to for report. So I maintain two sets of data, and one of them is formation. So this has all of my stuff in it. And when we get ready to do our fall start for the year, we send out a letter to all the families to say, here's what we have coming up in the program. So I have this schedule letter. And in my letter, I have two different things. I have one, this thing here that says list family schedule. And then I also have here down here, here's what we have on file for your email address. And it inserts in their email address. So I have this as an inserted field. So all I did is I came up here on insert field. And I chose the field that I wanted to insert, which was fam email one. Over on the right hand side, it's giving me a description of what that field is. And it's allowing me to say I'm going to print it in um, an uppercase and lowercase and postal case, or I want to have it specially formatted if I want to. And that's just going to stick that field in. This other part here is this family schedule. And you see it has that list inside of the brackets. A list works differently than a field. If I say to insert in member first name into my letter, it's only going to print the first member in that family. And it says, okay, I've printed the member, I'm moving on to the next thing. If I insert a list, it's going to rotate through all of the members in the family. So inserting a field inserts in the first value for that field. Inserting in a list inserts all of them, so it runs down through there. So what this list happens to do is it's going to list each kid and what class they've been assigned to. So if I pull this up, just so you have an idea of what this looks like. Where's the bench? There we go. Here's my schedule letter. So it says, your kids, Mike is going to be in the K-1 classroom, he's in room 10. Ben is in the Sunbeams classroom, he's in room 111. By the way, here's the email address we have for you on file. So this is the letter we send out to all of our families at the beginning of the year to let them know what's coming. So we can insert that list, which is going to repeat down that information for whatever I have in there. And I can insert in that field, which is just going to pop that email address value in there. So we can mail merge in both simple pieces of information and more complex things of information. The program comes pre-designed with about 30 lists. If you want to know what list they are, up here at the top there's this button that says insert list. And if you click on that, you're going to see all the available lists. And over on the right hand side, it gives you a description of what those are. So you can see here's this fam schedule. It prints the student schedules for the entire family. For each student, it prints the student name, the list of sessions, enroll, the names of the catechists, the room number, the time, and the date frequency. We happen to have modified that for the one that we use, so it just does the name, the room number, and the class name. So all of those can be modified as well. Does church offer insert list? It absolutely does. It just has a slightly different set of lists that go with it. Um, so both of them have that there. It's just that some of the lists are different between the two of them. But they all have that insert list option. And again, if you want to insert something and you don't see a list in there that already does what you're looking for, give us a call and say, I want to embed a list, or you can just say, I want to put some stuff somewhere, and we can probably get to what you're trying to do, uh, and create lists for you that you can then reuse. So I can take that fan schedule list and put that onto any letter and insert that same information. So when PDS was designing how the reports worked, they had the option of just making you do coding in the letter or creating these lists. And they thought the list was the better way to go because once you've done it once, you can copy just that little section onto any other report and have it work the same way there. So when you're looking at a financial report, for example, um, the one I was talking about earlier was charges and payments with return coupon. It has this super cool little coupon down at the bottom that has the little scissor icon and it has the family's name and address, their statement date, due date, ID, amount enclosed. And to put this onto a financial letter, all I have to do is take this line of code, list coupon bottom, 
and paste it into the body of any other financial letter. And it's going to add that coupon onto the bottom of the report. So I don't need to know any other coding. I just need to know what that list is called. And I could either copy and paste it, or I could have hit insert list and hit coupon bottom. And on any other financial report, now I have that little coupon at the bottom. So they try to do these embedded lists to make it easier to take parts of one report and move them over to another report. So again, give us a call if there's something you want to have in there that you don't see, and I can either tell you, hey, there's already a list that does that, or here's a list for you to use. So they try to make it so that we can kind of mix and match different pieces together with that. So if I didn't want to use one of these lists or letters that's already in here, I wanted to start from scratch, I can hit my add button down at the bottom. Right now I'm in the financial report section, but I can hit add, and I can choose letter. And when I click letter, it's going to bring me right to the modify the body of my letter. So this is the body of my letter. It's the information after dear Mr. and Mrs., but before sincerely. So it's all the stuff in the middle. So I could say, um, thank you for being a generous member of our parish. You have given. And I can hit insert field, and I can insert in their grand total paid to our parish so far this year. That means you have given, I'm going to say insert field, <coughs> and I'm going to say grand total average donation per week, X number of dollars per week. And I can insert that information in. I can type in whatever else I want to in here. You can see I spelled generous wrong, so I can fix that. Just like Word or Word Perfect, I can change my fonts, I can change my sizes, I can change the bold, all that kind of stuff. And I could have copied and pasted anything else in here that I wanted to. I'm going to click OK. And can anybody tell me what I should do right now? Yay! I should change the name of my report. So I'm going to say this is my letter about giving. If I wanted to throw a date in there or something else, I'm more than welcome to do that. I click Next. It's going to be my prayer information. I click Next, and it's my letter layout screen. So all I've done so far is filled in the body of my letter. On here, I can choose the letterhead style I want to use. I can choose the date style, my inside address style, my closing style, my margin style. So this is where we're putting the rest of the letter. And over here on the right, as I make changes, you'll see those changes kind of reflected with what I'm picking. So I want my family name, informal, meaning Dear John and Sarah, as opposed to the formal, which would be Dear Mr. and Mrs. I can choose my closing style. I can choose my margin styles, however I want this to look. With our letterheads, with our closing styles, we can include graphics inside of there. So if I come up here to my letterhead style, and I click Edit, and I click Edit Text, I can hit my insert up here. These would insert in fields. If I hit this insert up at the top, I can choose to insert in a graphic image. And I can browse to wherever I have those. Dropbox. Um, trying to think of where I have a logo. Oh, I have an interesting logo. <laughs> if you would want to have your letterhead listed as the grimy gal. Uh, my upcoming six-year-old's birthday party logo. Um, so you can put that into here. And I can right-click on it. And I can change this instead of being linked to character to being a movable graphic, which means that I can then move it kind of around here where I want it to, so it's not going to be text or character rack around it. Uh, so I can kind of adjust that, I can resize that, whatever I want to do with that. When you're adding in graphics, be careful of the size of the graphic that you insert. Not like the physical size of it, but the data size of it. If you insert in a graphic that's 5 megs, and you print out 1,000 of those letters, you're now sending 5,000 meg worth of data to your printer. Uh, which can sometimes overwhelm your printer. So the smaller the file size is, the better off that you are for inserting that information in there, just so that you're not sending huge amounts of data with what you're doing. So I click OK, and I click Save, 
and it pops up another box for me. And this is something that you need to be aware of when you are working with other people in your program. It says, hey, you changed a style that's already in here. Do you want to hit save and overwrite the original style? Or do you want to do save as and create a new style? I want to hit save as. If somebody else spent 10 hours, hopefully not 10 hours, but quite some time getting a letterhead all set up the way that they wanted and has their fonts and it's laid out the way they want it and you come in and change it to something else, somebody's going to be mad at you. And there's not anything I can do about that. So we can call things whatever we want. I'm going to hit save as. And now I'll still have my fancy letterhead and I'll also have my grimy gallop letterhead. So that, that way we can have as many different styles as we would want. Once I've added something into this letterhead style name, it's now available on any other letter I do in the program. Same way if I add a closing style in on one, it's now available as a closing style on every other letter, whether it's a family letter or a member letter or a financial letter, it doesn't matter. It does not go from program to program. So if I add it into church, it's not going to show up in formation, um, but it would be available in any other church report. So always save as. And if you want this to be your default letterhead, easiest way, anybody know? It's to stick an asterisk at the beginning of it. The lists are alphabetized, and whatever is alphabetically first is going to be the default when you run through it. Sticking an asterisk moves it up to the top of the list, and so it's going to make it my default when I'm running through things because it's alphabetically uh, closer than fancy, so because it has a little asterisk at the beginning. So sticking an asterisk at the beginning is going to make it the default setting for that. We have seen some places where secretaries go in and they can't decide which one they like more, so they just keep adding more asterisks. So it's like asterisk, 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 asterisk. Oh, you can see. And then like somebody else like, has like three, and so there's a second in the list, and they have to actually pick it when they run their report. But you can do whatever you like to with that. So I have my letterhead, my address style. Uh, my body, my closing style, and my margin style. Again, with the closing styles, you can see in my sample that I have a signature in here. If you have somebody who's scanned in their signature and has a saved as a graphic file, feel free to insert that in. And having a Word document that has a picture of a scan in it does not count as a graphic file. You can't insert in a Word document and have that insert in somebody's signature. You need the actual graphic file of the signature, not the Word document. So I hit next, and then I would be able to uh, fill in my date range for saying what their contributions were. So I could say 1104 to 123104, 14, and fund number one. I'm going to pull this up for envelope number 14 because I know he's given money. And here's my letter. It's going to have my lovely letterhead up at the top. And it's going to have their name and address. Thank you for being a generous member of our parish. You've given $2,575 to our parish so far this year. That means you have given $49.52 per week. Uh, sincerely, Robert Jones, the business manager. So it gives us the ability to insert in any of that information that we want, um, however we would like to do that. And again, if you're not sure what a feel is that you want to put in or you want to add in one of those lists, just give us a call. And we're happy to help you with that. I'm going to hit, oh, emailing it. So I've done my list, or done my letter, and now I decide instead of printing these out, I want to be able to send them out via email. On all of our letters, you're going to have this option right here that says email the letter. So I can simply click email the letter. And I can choose to email the letter to anybody who has preferred checked, meaning back on their list of emails, that little column that says preferred is checked, or anybody that just has an email address. So depending on what the email is, sometimes I might want to do preferred, sometimes I might want to do has an address, depending on what I'm trying to send. And with version 7, I can choose to send to multiple email addresses because we can have multiple family emails. I can choose this and it would send it to any of the emails in the list. <coughs> when I hit preview, I'm trying to see if somebody who has an email address. I forget what that lady is that had it. Yeah. 
find my report, letter about giving. It's easy to find because I remember to change the name. <coughs> and if you see it started to slow up a little bit when I got to that letter layout, that graphic that I have in there is like five meg. So even there you can see it taking a little bit longer. I'm gonna choose 13 and 14. I'm going to tell it to email it to anybody that has an address. And when I hit preview, it's going to say I have one record without an email address and one record with an email address. And click OK. If I had any without it, I would see that preview first and I could print out the ones that didn't have an email address. Now it's bringing me into my email screen so I can say who this should be from. I can say what the from email address should be, what the reply email address should be what the subject line should be. If I want to add any other attachments to this, maybe we're going to have a campaign about upcoming finances and there's going to be a parish-wide meeting and I could invite them to that. And then I can choose the type of email I want to send. I can send it as an image, which is basically an HTML email. I can send it as text or I can send it as a PDF document. So if I do it as image, it's going to look the closest to what it looks like in that preview screen and it's all going to come through in the body of their letter. However, some email programs can't display HTML. If they go to look at it on their phone, on an iPhone, an iPhone won't display an HTML email, so it's just gonna say, you can't view this. They'd have to look at it on their computer. Some other people have it so they don't display HTML because viruses can be embedded in that. If you do it as text, it's gonna be super basic. So you're not gonna see any graphics in there. You're not gonna see any special spacing inside of there. It's gonna be very basic text but it's gonna be viewable on anything. If you do it as a PDF document, what's down here in your email body will be what's in the body of the email, and then that letter is gonna be attached as a PDF to it. If you're doing a financial statement or something that you care specifically about them not being able to change or has very specific spacing needs, doing it as a PDF is your best option. So if you're going to send a registration form to somebody, we'd want to send it as a PDF. If we're going to send their tax statement to somebody, we'd want to send it as a PDF. So I pick the style I want. Then this email server setup is where you fill in what your email information is. That's your outgoing SMTP information. I do not know what your outgoing SMTP information is, and I have no way of finding out what your outgoing SMTP information is. That is something you would want to ask if you ever does your email. Um, and they would be able to tell you that. So it's usually if you've set up an Outlook account, it's what gets set up an Outlook that tells Outlook, send out using this information. So this would get filled in, and then I would hit start email, and it would send out my emails for me. Uh, so it's a way of being able to email out that information as opposed to uh, printing it and then sending it through the post office. And I'm going to because I don't actually want to email. Yeah. You use your dialysis account, and once they change something in the last year and a half, you can't email using that address. So you have to get like a Gmail or something else. A lot of using it with PDS. Like I have an account that deals just with PDS emails, and then I have my dialysis account. So, so a lot of times, you try to set it up. Don't it's don't use like a G diocese email. So a lot of places will either have their own church account or if they use an HBG account, they'll set up like a Gmail account for free and use that to send. Because you can fill in what you'd like for your from and your reply address, it's, we're talking about what gets filled in on this email server setup. So a lot of times they'll use like a Gmail address because it's easier than trying to go through the restrictions the diocese puts on how it does bulk mailing. Um, so it's a, it's a setting in terms of that email, and a lot of times people that have a large section like the Harrisburg Diocese does, they don't want to allow people to be bulk mailing out of it because it opens them up to getting blacklisted for other things. So that's usually why you're not able to do it through something like that. And I can, but if you have a Gmail address, a Comcast, a Verizon, <clears throat> there's usually not a problem with going out and doing things through there. And I'm going to hit cancel. And I can have the option of logging or not logging. Uh, if you remember back on the family screen, there's a section that says letters, visits, calls, etc. If I log information from here, that's where that's going to go. So it would log it with the date I printed it, with whatever description I filled in, and whatever I choose as my type. It would put a note back there telling me I had printed it for these people. So it's just a way of recording what it is that I've sent. If instead of doing a letter, I wanted to do a label. So labels, 
are in this label section. And our labels allow us to do uh, labels in uppercase or labels in mixed case. Depending on your post office, post office prefers things in uppercase. It makes it easier for their postal software to read. So it's going to be in all uppercase letters and it's going to take out any punctuation. So that makes them happier. The mixed case usually looks prettier. So depending on what you're using your label for, if it's going on like something and not like going through the mail, maybe you want to use mixed case. Or if you don't care about the post office, you can use mixed case as well. So you're going to earn my 44 cents or whatever it is. Um, it's up to you. So I'm going to choose my label reports in uppercase. And I have this one here called Family Mailing Label. And I'm going to go ahead and click Next. It's my overview screen. I'm going to click Next. It's my printer information. I'm going to click Next. And this button, just like with my letters, not grayed out. This is my Modify the Layout of the Address Information. And I can click in here, and I can use my Insert Field or Insert List or Insert Other and stick into this whatever I want. So maybe on these labels, I need to include the family's second ID number. So I'm just going to add in the text ID. I'm going to say insert field. And since I know I don't have second ID numbers in here, if I wanted the second ID number, I would pick the field that says second ID number. But so you can actually see data going in, I'm going to pick ID number. And I click OK. And I'm going to click preview. And here are my lovely labels with the ID numbers on them. Um, if I wanted to, I can choose the number of copies I want per label. Changing this is going to make the copies right next to each other. So I can see, I have a lot of families in my data. The Bennett's, the Bennett's, and the Brody's, the Brody's, the Bachman, the Bachman. So it's printing the copies right next to each other. If I wanted to use a partial sheet of labels for my shirt first sheet, I can tell it to skip four labels. It counts across and then down. And it's going to go ahead and skip the first four labels that I'm printing. Um, you can use the same sheet of labels through your printers more than once, but be very careful when you do. Because each time you stick it through, the glue is getting less and less sticky and more and more likely that that label is going to come off somewhere inside of your printer. And it is much cheaper to buy one new sheet of labels than it is to buy a new printer. Uh, and I speak from experience when it is also pretty impossible to get them back out from inside of the label or inside of the printer. My dad made me take apart a printer and get the label out, knowing full well that it wasn't going to work. Um, and I was covered in toner for a really long time. Was gross. So, but you can, uh, you know, one time through, two times through, you should be fine. So you can tell it to skip labels and would start printing on whatever label would be checked. With our labels, one of the questions that we get asked for a lot is, I have a mailing that I want to do. I'm going to send something out, um, the schedules for all of our ministry schedules. So I have altar servers and lectors and Eucharistic ministers. I need to send them the schedule for the winter. I have some families that have like multiple people. I have some families that only have one person. Sometimes it's the head of household. Sometimes it's the children. I only want to send one per family, but I want it to go to the right people. If I did it as my family mailing envelope, it's going to be addressed to Mr. and Mrs. whoever. If I do it as a member label, I'm going to get it addressed to the right people, but I'm going to get one per member. I have this report here that's called Mailing Label to Selected Family Members. And this is in all the versions of the program. And when I run this, it uses a field that's called FAM Member Full Name. So this is a field that's standard in the program. And what it does, I'm just going to preview it first with no selections, is it lists every member in the family. So I have Stephen, Kristen, Brianna, Ian, and James Bennett, William, Alexander, Brody, Doris, Bachman, Mark, Noreen, Mark, and Theodore Bobbick. Um, if somebody has a different last name, it's going to say like Amy Mensch and Bill Smith. So it includes first and last names for every member that it prints. <laughs> if I put a selection in when I run this, so if I say that mem date of birth is between uh, 9-1-2008 and 08-31-2010, now it's going to find anybody who has a member that matches that, and it's going to be addressed to the people that match that. So for the O'Briens, that's Corey and Zane O'Brien. 
for the Mitchells, it's just Kellen Mitchell. Yeah, I could have said that Mem Ministries Ministry is in list and is an altar server or a Eucharistic minister or a lector. There you are. And now it's going to be addressed to my altar servers, my lectors, and my Eucharistic minister. So I have John and Bridget Brennan, but just Karen Flad. So it's addressed to the people that match the criteria, and I can have multiple names on that label if there's multiple people in the family that match it. So it allows me to specifically target my label and still get one per family. And that's available. Yep. Yeah. And what was the title of that? It's called Mailing Label to Selected Family Members. And it's in the family report section. A lot of times people go to look for that under the member section, but it's in the family label section. And it's family mailing label to select or mailing label to select the family members. Amy, on, yeah. on the same idea, these same people you can email okay. and rather than make a label, yeah. you could go in and say, I want the lectors, the altar servers, mm -hmm. the recursive ministers, and yeah. send them an email of that mm -hmm. schedule. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. So I could have emailed it to them and attached that schedule as there. But say some of them didn't have email addresses, yes. I'm going to do my labels. And I don't want to print out labels for people I just emailed. Right. If you notice, there's a little option here that says skip the label of email. So if I click this option, and then I can choose that same thing I had before between preferred or has an email address. So I'd want to pick whichever option I did when I did my email. And now it's only going to do the people that don't have the email address that match with my criteria. So it allows me to do the labels that are going to actually line up with the letters that I have printed and skip the labels for the ones that I email. So it tries to think of things for you like that. Do you have all this on tape? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's getting taped right now. Okay. So you'll be able to watch this back. Okay. So we're up to the very last thing on our first page, which is adding an export. So one of the things that happens at a certain point is that all of this is great, but somebody else needs to do something with my data. So the diocese needs to see information about something, or uh, the high school wants to have a list of all of the kids that are gonna be eligible for high school because they're gonna do a mailing. Somebody else needs something from my data. The finance committee wants to look at something, or the, this committee wants to look at something, or I wanna do something. Anything that is in our program, we can export out with the exception of financial um, credit card and bank account information. So if you have account numbers, bank account numbers, you can't export that out. Everything else is fair game. So when we're in our list of reports, if I want to export out family information, I can click my add button at the bottom and I can choose to add an export report. So I choose export and just like when I was creating my list, I have my list of fields to print. So these are my list of fields to export. So I'm just going to choose whichever fields it is that I want to include. This is a place where I don't want to use address block. The nature of spreadsheets is that you want everything on one line. You don't want everything on multiple lines. So the address block would go onto a multiple line, which would not be good for an export. So I'd want to pick address one. I'd want to pick address two. I'd want city. I want email, I want mailing name, I need my phone number, so where are you? and I want my zip code. I can have these in whatever order I want. I can reorder them over on this side by clicking and dragging. One of the things that people ask me a lot is, I have no idea, there's all these fields, how do I know which field it is that I actually want? This is a place where the family listing screen can be super helpful for you. I'm gonna pop out of this and take you over there so you can see what I'm talking about. If I'm on the family screen, over on the left-hand side, I have this option for listing screen, and it shows me one big giant long list of all of my families. I have this customized view button at the bottom that's gonna bring up the same screen that we saw with that modified list of fields to export. I can add any field on here that I want to. So I can say, I think I want the address one and address two, and I think I want this alternate city. So I'm gonna stick these in here and see if that's really what I want. So let me just get rid of that other stuff. And I look, address one, yep, that looks great. 
address two, most people don't have an address line two, so I'm not worried that it's blank. But alternate city, ooh, that's all empty. I'm guessing that's probably not the field that I'm looking for. So using that customized view is an easy way of being able to see if these are actually the fields that I'm looking for without having to build my export the whole way out, open it up in Excel and be like, oh man, now I have to do this whole thing again. So this view listing is an easy way just to kind of get a really quick idea if this is what I'm looking for. Does anybody know why alternate city won't work? It's because it is looking at the alternate address. Back on the family screen, you have the option over here for other addresses, and you have a section called alternate address. It's specifically pulling this field of information, which the vast majority of your families don't have filled in. So people get confused because it's up at the top. So they think address one, address two, oh, that's the first city I see, I'm gonna take it. You want the one that's actually called just city, so that it doesn't have alternate in front of it. Let me come back down to my export. There we go. So I'm on my list of fields, so I want to get rid of, or I have the fan city here, my email address, my phone number, my zip. I could add whatever other fields I want to on here. The other thing I would say with an export is if you're not sure between two fields, include them both. It is very easy in Excel to delete a column. So it's not like you're taking up page space on a paper. So if you're not sure which one you want, stick them both in, or stick all three of them in, or whatever ones you can't decide between, and let whoever's looking at it figure out which one they actually want. Um, so when in doubt, throw it in. So I have my fields on here. I hit save okay. And it's gonna ask me what the export format that I want is. We always recommend this first one, which is comma separated value. And then underneath of that is the file name. This is where the vast majority of our people go wrong. <laughs> they stick it somewhere and then have no idea where they put it or they stick it in somewhere and they don't name it properly so they can't find it again. So the easiest way to do this, click the little yellow file folder at the end of the line. It's gonna bring up your Windows commands in the same way if you were saving a file from Word. You can choose where you wanna save it, so you can look on your desktop, you can go to your documents section, wherever your heart desires to save this, just make sure you remember where you've actually put it. And then you wanna give it a name, and you want to end it with .csv. It's the same thing as right up here. Adding that .csv is what tells Windows what program to use to open it with. If you don't stick that on the end, Windows will say, I don't know what to do with this program or this file. If you go into Excel and try to find it, you're not going to see it because Excel says this isn't an Excel document. I'm not going to open it up. So we want to make sure we leave that .csv at the end. I can hit next, I can make any selections that I wanted to, and then I can hit, I'm just going to do this because there's so many in here. I'm saying do envelopes one through a thousand. It's going to build my report for me, and once it's done, I can either hit close or I can hit view file. If I hit view file, it's going to open it up for me in Excel. And here's my document, so I have my mailing name, my address, my city, my email, my phone number, and my zip. Uh, you can make your columns as big or as wide as you want to, whatever you would like to do with it, and then you can send it to whoever needs it. So we can pick anything we want to, send it to Excel, and then do whatever we would like to with it from there. So if you're somebody who likes to do mail merges between Word and Excel as opposed to inside of the program, have at it. If you have someone who needs a copy somewhere else, send it to them this way. So this is the cleanest way to get your information back out of the program. If you were here this morning, we talked about the ability to print a report to a file. Uh, so for example, if I have my family quick listing report and I have it previewed, I can hit the print button and I can choose print to file and I can print this to an Excel document and I'm going to have an Excel document version of this the downside of doing it this way, it's easier and faster, but I'm gonna have all my page heading information in there, I'm gonna have all my page number information down at the bottom, and I'm gonna to have to do a lot more cleanup work in my end file 
And so usually taking the time to set up the export is less time than it is to clean up the document after I printed it this way. So the printifile tends to work best for creating PDF documents or Word documents. It tends not to be the best option for creating Excel documents. And the reason being is that most reports that are designed to be printed on paper have a layout that is different than one that's designed to be sent to a spreadsheet. So for example, you can see that this is maximizing space this way by printing the address stacked. But if I sent this to a spreadsheet, now I'm gonna have two rows for every family, and that's not convenient for doing a spreadsheet where I don't care how long it goes this way. So reports are designed differently to be a spreadsheet report or to be a report that's going to be printed on actual paper. So usually doing an add and export is going to give you the cleanest way of getting that data out of the program. Does anybody have questions on exports? Okay, so again, with exports, end it with .csv and write down where you wrote it to so that you can find it when you're done. If we flip over to page two, we're going to go ahead and start looking at some report layout exercises. So I'm going to run through these. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly so that we can get to the next half of our report information. Um, but all the directions for these are already written out and typed out, and you will be getting an email with them tomorrow, so you don't need to worry about writing them down as I'm going through them. We'll have them all typed out. It's going to say, click reports, click family reports, click listing reports, click family quick listing, click next. Uh, so it has them all step by step going through there. So the first thing it wants me to do is to create a family list with an email address. So the easiest way to do this one is to copy an existing report and modify it. So I'm going to take my family quick listing, I'm going to hit copy, I'm going to hit next, I'm going to change my report to say that this is my fam list with email, and I'm going to click modify the list of fields to print. And over on the left hand side, I'm going to choose fam email one, which means it's the first email address on the family screen. I'm going to double click on it to add it and hit save. And there's my list with my email address. So it's not too difficult. I'm just adding that field into there. The second one that I want is a member list with parent names. So instead of going to the family report section, I want to jump down to my member report section. I can either click members and then reports on the left or I can choose this option up here that says all reports, which is then going to display all of my reports. I'm going to come down to my member reports, and just like with families, I have a member quick report. I'm going to copy that one. I'm going to hit next, and I'm going to rename it. Mem list with parent names. And I'm going to click on modify the list of fields to print, just like I did with my first one. And I want to include the family names on it. So I don't want to go to the mem section because that's just going to keep including that member's name. I want to come down to my family section. And I could either pull the fields that are called father name and the field that's called mother name, which would include my head and my spouse. Or I could choose first name and spouse first name. Or if I look into this name section, there's all of these name formats. And it has a little parenthesis after that that tells me an example of how that's going to look. So name format one is the title, the head's first name, and last name. Name format 12 is the nickname for the head and the nickname for the spouse. Uh, name format 13 tends to be the most popular and includes the head's first name, the spouse's first name, and their last name. So that tends to be the one that most people would pick. So I double click on it. And that's going to add that over there. If you notice, the heading now says fam name format John and Mary Smith Jr. And that's going to print at the top of that column. What I may want to do is change my heading to say parents, just so that when it prints out, it looks a little bit nicer than that ridiculously long title when I'm there. And then here's my preview. So I have my member's name, the address, the phone number, and then the parents in that last column. And I'm going to hit close. The next one, a contribution list with activity amount. We get this question a lot around Easter and a lot around Christmas and a lot around block collection time. Um, so what will happen is you'll have a big donation and somebody wants to know how much each family gave to that specific collection. 
So you collect money for the tsunami relief fund, or you connect money, collect money for um, bishops relief. So something where it's a specific activity. If I were to run the one line family list with fund total, it's giving me how much they gave to the entire fund, not to a specific activity. So it's going to include a grand total paid. I don't want a grand total paid. I want just what they gave to this specific activity. And most of the time, when we're collecting money for one thing, we're also collecting money for something else at the same time, like the offering. So people are sticking in money to the offering along with sticking in an envelope for something else. So limiting it by the date range usually doesn't give me what I'm looking for. I'm going to take this one line family list with fund total. It's the same report basically as my family quick list, but with a grand total paid added on at the end. And I'm going to use that as my copy. I'm going to change my name, family list with activity total. And I'm going to click on modify the list of fields to print. I'm going to get rid of my grand total paid. And instead, I want to use the section from Calc Fund Act. This is the activity section. And I'm telling it I want it to include the activity and the amount. So that's going to tell me the specific activity and how much was given to that specific activity. And I'm going to hit save. I'm going to fill in the date range that I'm looking for. And we're going to make a guess as to what activity they may have given to recently. Uh, next. To restrict to that, this is actually going to be something that comes up again in our report selection activities. Um, I'm going to go back to that same Calc Fund Act section. I'm going to choose activity and I'm going to pick the activity I'm looking for. I'm going to put Ash Wednesday already happened. I'm going to say Calc Fund Act and amount. If I didn't put in the second line, it would give me everybody and how much they gave to Ash Wednesday, even if they didn't give anything. By putting in that the Calc Fund Act is greater than zero, it's going to give me only people who gave to Ash Wednesday which, yay, some people did. If you notice, there's a super helpful little minimize button that got added in like around like version five. You can have multiple copies of the program open at the same time. So if you're running a report like this and it's like, do to do, I don't want to sit here and wait for it for forever, I can always say minimize and open up another copy and go and do something else while that first report is running. So FYI, if you are impatient and want to keep doing other stuff, you can certainly do that. If, what if you're updating something that's going to work? Uh, okay. <coughs> if you're doing something that requires exclusive use in the program, such as doing a backup, or running like a fix in the data, you can't do that. But if you're just running a report or posting contributions or anything else like that, yeah, it's the same as you being in on your workstation and somebody else being in on another workstation. It's just that it happens to be the same workstation. So it's no problem. And that'll be saved in yep. there? Yep. Sure. So here's my report, here's all my Ash Wednesdays, and here's how much they gave specifically to Ash Wednesday. So it's just looking at that Calc Fund Act amount. Um, and again, those directions are going to be in there. So if you ever want to do that and you forget in six months from now when it's time to do the Christmas report, you're like, I know she talked about that. Now you'll have the directions written for you. Because <laughs> I highly expect you to forget that. Because it's something you do like once and it's like, oh, man. Okay. Next report. Family letter with Christmas services information. I guess I have Christmas on the brain. So I want to send a letter out to all of my families and tell them what the mass times are going to be for Christmas and other special Christmas activities that we're going to have coming up. So I'm going to go to my family report section to do that. And I'm going to click my add button down at the bottom and I'm going to choose to add in a letter. It's going to take me right to the body of my letter. If somebody has emailed me with that information, I can copy and paste it in. I can put in whatever the text is going to be. I click OK. It's going to lead me on my overview. What do I want to do now? Change the name. So I can change the name so I don't have eight gazillion new letter reports, Christmas service info. 
I can click next, whatever printer information, pick all the rest of my letter information. You're gonna see that it defaults to the grimy gallop for my letterhead. I can drop that down and pick whatever else that I want to. If you are planning on emailing your letters, I would highly recommend picking a much um, less fancy uh, letterhead style. If you're only going to email your letters, I would recommend no letterhead. Because if it's going in just into the body of your letter, so you're gonna do a text or an uh, HTML option, which were those first two, the less information in there that you have, the better. People get bored very easily, and they tend to glance at something that comes into their email and not necessarily read it through. So if they're going to glance at something, you'd rather them glance at the body of your letter and not at your letterhead. So the sooner you get what you want them to know in front of their eyes, the better off that you are. So if you're going to email, we would recommend not doing a letterhead style at all, and not doing a date at all, and not doing an inside address at all. But it is up to you with whatever you would like to do. And if you're going to print them, then you would want them to look nicer than if you're going to email them. Yes? We do letters in Spanish. Okay. But it doesn't recognize the symbols. Okay. That is a keyboard symbol usually that's, or a keyboard that's yes. usually there. Um, do you mean that it's showing up as well, we spelled incorrectly it or that it's Spanish? Okay. But when we do the letter on PDS. If I record someone in with the, with the accent. Like the tildes and the. Yeah. When I print a report, it just gives me like a funny symbol. Okay. It doesn't give any actual. Remind me, we can take a look at that because I'm not sure if it's a key, if it's a display setting or what it is. It could also be the font or the printer, but we have to take a look at that. Okay. The other thing when we're doing um, multilingual letters, back on your family screen, for the head of household, if I come into members, there's this language section. If I have my language here set as Spanish, if he's the head of household, that basically defaults that family to having a language first of Spanish. Spanish slash English is gonna to default to Spanish first but with English afterwards, so it thinks Spanish is the primary language. When I go to run a report, and come back over to my family letters, and see if I can remember in my head without having, because I do this like, not very often, you can put in two different texts in your letter. So you can say that if there we go. So if language is this, then insert in this text, and it's going to say adios and have it there, or you know, um, my my Spanish is telling me. I have like a Dora level Spanish, um, so I can do colors and I can do numbers and a couple animals. And <laughs> so, we want to talk about the blue dog, we're good to go. But we can put this in, so it would do two different texts. You would have to know what you want the Spanish to actually say. You have to know what you want the English to say, but it's going to uh, put different text on the letter depending on what that person's language is listed as. Fact, so, I've done, I've this, done letters like for length review, where I've done the Spanish yeah. up on top, mm -hmm. and done the, uh, the yeah, I, I've inserted the actual mm -hmm. length of the donations, and then I've done the English on the bottom. Yeah, but it doesn't recognize like mistakes if, if I put that I like the N. Yeah, it puts it in there, but when I print it, yeah, it let me know if we can look at that it. later because it's usually a display type thing. It's not something from the program; it's something from the window side of things. But we can take a look at that. Um, but it allows us to do multi-language in there. Again, you just need to know what the Spanish or English text should be. It won't automatically translate things for you because that would turn out horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, it would not be a good thing. So we can do our letters that way and stick our information in. Um, member label address to the parents of. So say we want to do a label and we want to send it to the individual member, but we want the top of the label to say to the parents of. If I come down to my member reports and my labels, I'm gonna pick between upper or mixed case. I could do it right on my member mailing label, but this is something where we'd recommend making a copy of it, because otherwise, the next time someone used the member mailing label, it would still say to the parents of, and they'd have to remember to go in and change it. So it's better to make a copy of it. And I'm gonna say that this should be my parents of. Would help if I can type. There we go. I'm going to click on modify, and all I have to do is type in the text that I want. 
This is going to be up on that first line. I click OK. And now here's my labels. And they'll all say to the parents of. If I wanted to bring that down a little bit, I could have just put another line in there. So I would just click the Enter button to move that down a little bit. If you notice that all my text is over a little bit to the right, I do not want to use the tab key to tab things over. If I tab things over, I will show you what that will look like. You're going to see that everything except for this line is tabbed. Because that's that address block, when you hit tab, it tabs over the first line, but not the second line. So that does not help you or look very good. So instead, what you would want to do, let me take that tab back out of there. is if you highlight it, there's this button up at the top that says increment indent. If I hit that, it's gonna bump over all of the lines and not just the first line. So you wanna be careful of how much you indent that because now you can see the zip codes had to wrap around down to another line. And at a certain point, there's only so much space on the label. Uh, but we can do those, yeah? If you um, would go back and look at that, the labels you just printed, mm -hmm. if you have like an extra address two line on, some of them would not print on that label. You cannot individually do that. You just have to like print that label separately, correct? Uh, what I could do is if I noticed that before I hit print, so I have it previewed and I'm like, oh, that was the second gonna... label. Like yeah. There was a second, yeah, there was yeah. a second line. Another I line. can hit print. I can choose print to file. Instead of choosing PDF, I could choose my word one, which is this one. And then and I can say, OK. Now. And I'm going to hit cancel at a certain point here because I don't need that many. But now it's going to open up, and I can click in here and correct that one and then send it to the printer. So depending on what I wanted to do, uh, how much time I care about that one particular person's label. So sometimes it's easier to do <laughs> just right. that one person later. Uh, and the last one we had was a contribution statement with the return coupon. So this is the one that I talked about when we were talking about financial statements. It's in the financial report section, it's in the financial statement section, and it's called Charges and Payments with Return Coupon. It's a favor billing statement. Uh, I click next. I'm trying to see if there was something special about this. I don't think so. So I'm doing printer information. I can fill in whatever options I want as far as the cutoff date. I fill in my letter options. If I wanted to add in any other text, onto this statement, I can click on modify the body of the letter. It has those default or embedded lists built into it, so I could copy out that coupon bottom and put it onto a different one if I wanted to, or I can add other text into my statement besides just the default text that comes with it. And then I would just have to fill in the date range for my fund. So if I was doing this for tuition, grimy gallop at the top because that's now my default. So then I have my letter down here, the registration deposit was paid, their scholarship was paid, they have a tuition due of this much, they've made this payment, they got this much script credit, their current amount due is zero, this is how much they pledged, how much they're paying semi-annually, and here's their little coupon down at the bottom. So this person happens to not owe anything right now, so I probably wouldn't be sending them a statement. But if it was someone who owed money, this would look a lot cooler. And then I can hit close. And again, you're going to get directions or the written out directions for all of those. The next thing that we want to talk about are the selections of how we're actually picking the people that are showing up on these lists. So if you remember what versus who, everything we've looked at so far has been the what side of things. What we're going to look at now is the who side of things. So how we get specific families or groups of families onto our reports. So when we're doing this, we're basically going to be working off of that select the family screen. So I'm just on my family quick list. I'm going to come up to that screen. So when we're here on our select the family screen, we have a couple different ways of restricting this. The first thing that we can do is we can restrict based off of our active or inactive boxes. The default is always to include active families and never to include inactive families. 
And it's also defaulted to not include family marked as loose collection. If you were here this morning, we talked about the loose family. It's the family with bracket loose as the ID number, and it's the family that's set up to, to um, store loose contributions or money that comes in that can't be attributed to a particular person. So the default is to not include that person when we're doing our family report since they're not a real family. So my first thing is that I can include inactive families, which normally we're not doing. The second way that I can restrict my report is with my family selections tab. The family selections lets me restrict by ID number or specific name. So with the data that I have, I know that envelope numbers one through 6,000 are the regular parishioners. Envelope numbers 8,000 to 9,000 are school families that aren't members of their parish. And envelope numbers 9,000 to 9999 are people who contribute to their capital campaign but aren't regular members of their parish. So if I'm doing a regular family list, I may only want to send this to envelope numbers 1 through 5999. So one colon and then the next number is going to give me envelopes this through that. So the colon is a range. If I did one comma 599, that's going to give me two families. It's going to give me family number one and family 5999. So the comma is a separator, the colon is a range. And if you forget, there's a little sample up here that shows you both of them. I think you can also do it that way and type it through. But I always do the colon because it's less typing. And I also don't have to remember which way to spell through. So I have that there. The bottom part lets me spe uh, pick specific families. So I get a list from father. He says, I want you to contact these 10 families. Or I have 15 families that call and want a tax statement. I can tag those 15 families. You can do as many of these as you want to. I can just click the little box next to them. If I'm on that line and I hit the space bar, the space bar is the same as clicking on it. So if I'm going down with my arrow, space, arrow, um, that might save you time. I don't know. It depends on how fast you are with the keyboard. You have that same alphabet bar running across the top up here. So if I'm jumping up and down in the list, and if you remember, it's usually easier if you go into somebody whose last name is Strain to go down to the T's and come up than it is to go to the S's and go down. So think about the spelling of the name before you click on the letter. So you can kind of jump around inside of here to go to the family that you're looking for. And you can again tag as many of these as you would like to. So this allows me to pick specific people. I want this group of envelope numbers. I want these specific people. The other way we have of restricting information is this additional selection screen. This is one of the hardest things to learn in the program, but it's one of the most powerful things inside of the program. It is logical, it's just that it's not the same logic that you might use in other situations. So really what we're doing is we're saying three things. We're saying that a particular field has a certain type of relationship with a particular value. So we have field, relationship, and value. So we're picking these three things every time we stick in a condition. The first part is the field. So we're saying what field of information in the program we're looking for. When I click where it says click here to add a new condition, that's the first thing it wants to know is what's the field. The fields are organized by the screens that they're found on. So if I'm trying to find people who have registered within the last year, I know that I fill in the date that they registered back on that main family screen, so I'm going to look on that main family section for that field. So if I go to the FAM section, I want to look for date registered, and there it is. So I'm going to pick my field. The second thing I need to pick is my relationship. The default relationship is is equal to, but if I click on those actual words, it shows me all of my other relationship choices. I could say is not equal to, is less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, is in list, is not in the list, is between, is ever equal to, or is never equal to. Um, so I'm saying what the value that I'm about to fill in, what relationship it has to that field. So if I want to find people who have registered since January, I could say is greater than or equal to 0101 2014. If I want people who've registered between January and June, I'm going to say is between January and June 31st, 2114. So I can do different types of things depending on which relationship value I fill in. 
And then the last part is the actual value that I'm looking for. If it's a date field, when I click on this, it's going to prompt me for a date entry, or I can click the little date button to pull it up. If I pick something like a city, so if I'm saying I want anybody who lives in a particular city, when I click on that blank line, it's going to show me the list of all of my cities. So if the field that I've picked is a drop down list, when I click on that value, I'm going to see the same drop down list. They do that so it's easier to pick what you're looking for and less likely that you're going to type in something incorrect. Um, so I could say I want everybody who lives in Bear, Delaware. If it's going to be a value that's a dollar amount, I don't want to type in the dollar symbol. I don't need to put in the decimal points and the periods. I don't want to put in a comma with a number. So you're basically just typing in the text the way that you would want it to be. Once you've filled in the selections the way that you want them, and you've figured out what it is that you want, there are two different things that we would recommend doing. Either both of them are ways of saving that information. The first and the easiest, hit Control and P, which will send a shot to your printer. And you can say, hey, here's how that information looks. I don't know why I just did that since I don't have a printer hooked up to it. But you would hit that Control and P and send that to your printer. Stick it with a copy of the report. So the next time you have to run this report, you say, hey, I know that I spent two hours and I finally got what it is, and now I don't remember what it was because I did it three months ago. This is what I picked, and now I can do it again. So control and P, make a screenshot of it. If you don't like having sheets of paper sitting around in your office, Alt, the Alt button, the ALT down at the bottom, and the print screen button on your keyboard. So Alt and print screen, take a screenshot of what you're currently looking at, and then go into Windows, or I'm sorry, into Word and hit Control and Paste, and it will paste in a picture of what you were just looking at. That works in any Windows program. Alt and print screen, go into Word and hit Paste, and you will have a picture of what you were just looking at on your computer. And you can make your own little cheat sheet guide that is saved somewhere on your computer, and you can reference it later and you haven't thrown it out or torn it or spill coffee all over it or whatever else happens to things on your desk, which I'm sure would never happen online. <laughs> um, so ways of being able to save that. So control and P to get a physical copy, alt and print screen to get an electric, electronic copy. The other thing that you can do is if you notice over here on the left, we have these saved selections. Once I have a selection filled in, I can save that for future use. I do it by hitting the save button down here. I can give it a name, so I can say that these are new families in Bear, Delaware. I want to name it with something that actually tells me what it's doing. I can fill in the description if I would like to, and I'm just going to hit save again so that, that shows up. This selection is now available for me to use on any other family report. So I did my family list. I give it to Father, he says, that looks great, let's do letters to those people. When I go in to do a letter, I can pick that same selection, then I can go in to do my labels and pick the same selection again. So I can keep reusing that same selection. The selection remembers this. It remembers the logic statement I use to get my list. It does not remember the people it found. It reruns the selection every single time which means that when I run it again next month, it's going to find the people that it matches at that moment in time, which may be more or less than today, depending on if I've added people, removed people, whatever's going on. So it's always running a fresh list whenever I use a save selection. We always recommend, if you're using a save selection, that you take the time to click on the Family Selections tab and the Additional Selections tab before you hit Preview. It's very easy to overwrite a save selection. So say I come through and I'm doing my report again, and I had to do labels, and the one label was off the page. And so I need, now I need to redo just that one person's label. So I come into <coughs> family selections, and I tag just that one family, I print it, and I'm done. The next time I go to run this report, it's not only remembering this, it's also remembering what I've picked over here, and I'm still only going to get that one person. So we get this call all the time. This report always works for me, and all of a sudden it's not working anymore. I'm only getting this one person. It's because something got tagged off 
uh, and then it saved that same selection. So always take the time just to look at those before you hit preview. The other thing is with version 7, this program is going to remember that the last time I ran the family quick list, I ran it with the families in Bear Delaware selection. So the next time I come in and run that report, it's going to default to this selection. So if I'm trying to get every family and I don't realize that this one is picked off, I'm going to have a much different report than what I'm expecting to get. So it's worth taking a look over here and just saying, oh yeah, I want it to be on simple selection, never saved, which is the default until you pick something else. So the program tries to anticipate what you're going to want, but we don't always want what it anticipates that we want, if you understand what I'm saying. So we can fill in our selections, we can save our selections. If you see these buttons down here at the bottom, there's import selection and export selection. People get really excited and like, oh, I can just export out what it finds to a spreadsheet. That's not what this does. What this button right here does is it exports out this information, that this is what you're looking for and this is what you're looking for. It doesn't have anything to do with what's actually on your report. What this was originally meant for is say the diocese came up with a complex selection of what they're looking for and they wanted everybody to use that same selection. They can create it once, export it, and then send it out to everybody and they can import that same selection. But that rarely ever gets used. Um, so most people have no idea what that button does. But now you know. Yes? Can you explain a bit when to use the all, any, okay. button up there? <laughs> so for example, right now I have this set to say all. So it's looking for the date registered is between this and it's equal to this. Let me show you a popular one that uses those. So I'm trying to find out who people are that shouldn't be getting envelopes. It costs money to send envelopes to people. We don't necessarily want to send envelopes to everybody because that's not the most cost-effective way of doing it. So I'm trying to find who I can get rid of. So I'm going to come through and I'm going to look at what people have given in the last two years to fund number one. So I'm looking at date range of 010113 to 123114, and I'm looking at fund number one. I want to get a list of everybody where their grand total paid is equal to zero. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do it the other way. Uh, when people grand total paid is greater than zero, and I want to find everybody who might be new to the church, who hasn't had time to give yet. So I can say that their date registered is greater than or equal to, we'll give them six months, so February 1st of 2014. If I ran this this way, it's going to have find people who have given and are new. If I change all to any, it's going to find people who either have given or are new. So with the any, they have to match just one of them. With the all, they have to match all of them. So all means it has to be everything on there. Any means it could be any one of them. So if I'm trying to find people who have given or are new, I want to use that any button. Um, it might be something like I'm saying, I want to find people where the head of the household is single or where there's only one person in the family. Um, so maybe I'm going to say that the, a selection like that would say mem marital status is single and mem relationship or FAM number of members is equal to one. And I could change that all to any. So now I'm saying you either have to have one person in your family or the person in your family who's marked as head of household is single. So that's going to give me both of those people if I have this up at any. If I change that to all, 
they would have to be the only person in their household and single in order to show up on my list. So we can kind of get a really complex set of selections in here. Most of the time you're having one, maybe two things in here, but there are gonna be times when you might have six, seven, or eight things all listed here. Usually you just wanna give us a call and we can log in or send you the directions for what you would wanna to do to get those criteria in there. Because um, you can start to get pretty complex with what we're looking for. Yeah. How did you get the two choices? The oh, one and the two. So mm -hmm. No, not that one. The, the left, yeah, this that one. one and the so you piece. see this button up here that's next to uh -huh. choose? Uh -huh. If I click on this, if I choose add condition, and add, it would add three. Uh -huh. If I choose add subsection, it would add 3.1. Okay. So subsection is going to give me it with this kind. Regular condition is going to give me it with this kind. So there's also, if I click on the two, I can choose to indent or unindent or move up or move down to kind of reorganize those in there. So it just depends on what it is that I'm looking to do with it. But again, this is something where once I get a complex one like this, definitely take a screenshot of it and make a save selection of it so that way you don't have to refill this in again when you need to go run it the next time. Um, okay, so we're down to section eight now which is report selection exercises. So we're gonna go through, we've got 15 more minutes, okay. We're gonna go through some of these report selections. And again, I'm gonna go through them quickly because they're all typed out for us already and we're gonna send those or email those out to you. So the first one is if I wanted to print out a list of all of my families with ID numbers between one and 100 and 500 to 999,000. 999. I'm just on my family quick list. Underneath the family selections, the easiest way would be to say one colon 100 comma 500 colon 999 999. And that's going to give me envelopes one through 100 and 500 through 999,999. If I wanted families who are living in Phoenix or in Mesa. I could do it one of two ways. I could either say that Fan City is equal to, I'm gonna pick whatever my first two cities are, Aberdeen, Maryland, Fan City is equal to Acton, Massachusetts, and change my all to any. And that's gonna be either there in this city or in that city. The easier thing to do would have been to say that Fan City and instead of is equal to, I can say is in list. And the is in list lets me pick multiple values. So I can say it's this one or this one. So this is the same thing as if I'm trying to print a list of people who are single. I could say that marital status is in list and pick single or divorced or widowed or annulled. Because all four of those would technically be single, um, but I don't want to put in four different criteria and change it to any. I can say is in list, and it's really doing the same thing. Or when I'm looking for my altar servers and lectors and Eucharistic ministers, I don't want someone who's all three of them. I can say is in list, and then tag the ministries that I'm looking for. Family registered in 2008. I can say fam and date registered. Where are you? And I can say contains 2008. Or I could say is between and 0101 2008 through 1231 2008. And that's going to give me anybody that has a date registered between those dates. Uh, families without an email address. I'm going to say that fam and email one. And I'm going to say just like this is equal to blank. That's going to find me people who don't have anything filled in in that field. So if I was trying to find people who didn't have a marital status filled in, it would be mem marital status is equal to blank. Or if I'm looking for people who don't have a date of birth filled in, mem date of birth is equal to blank. That is equal to blank means that nothing has been filled in in that field. Amy, can you do that with sacraments as well? Uh, I could say, yeah, that the sacrament date is equal to blank or the sacrament status is equal to blank. So it's okay. usually the status that's been filled in over the date. So I would say that uh, under the men section, sac baptism status is equal to blank. 
it's another place where I might have to put in two different conditions. Mm -hmm. If somebody had filled in the status to no, um, so I could say that SAC baptism status. Where are you? Status is equal to no, and I could say any. So that's going to find me people who either it says no on there or it's blank. So I could use that any to be able to capture both of those. Uh, family with a keyword of return census card. So if I'm looking for anything with my keywords, it's going to be this section that says fam keyword, and then it's equal to, and then whatever the one is. I don't use that in this data, so I could say send no mail or whatever the keyword had been. And I would just pick the keyword that I'm looking for. And if you flip over, we have a couple member selections. And one of the things that might be fun for you, I might have a different. <laughs> what fun contains. But fun for you is when you get home, take your list of exercises, try to do them by yourself first, and then you can have that cheat sheet of, okay, here's what I should have actually done. But try them by yourself first and see how much of that you can do without having the directions in front of you. I don't know if that'll be fun for you or not. <laughs> maybe, maybe it will. So my member quick report, so I'm looking at the top of there, so I have three ones under members here. The first selection was trying to find members who were born between 2005 and 2006. So I would say that mem and date of birth is between, and then 901, 2005, and 831, 2006. If you remember in like the old DOS version, you would have had to put two lines in where it said mem date of birth is greater than or equal to 9105, and then mem date of birth is less than or equal to 83106. And you could still do that here, but that is between, it's just much easier to do. Uh, here's that one we just talked about, members who are altar servers, electors, or Eucharistic ministers. It's that ministries, ministry, and is in list, and then tagging the ministries that I'm looking for. Same way with the next one for members who are single, I'm picking that mem and marital status, and I'm saying is in list, and then tagging the marital statuses that I'm looking for, so divorced, single, widowed, annulled, or whatever. I don't know if they would consider separated to be single, I guess it depends on what it is that you're looking for. Um, Again, we make no judgments. We let you pick what you would like to do with that. Unknown would be good in there. There you go. Yeah, unknown. I don't know. You throw in a mixer, I don't know. That would be very interesting. So the last section here for exercises is this financial totals report uh, one. So I'm using the financial totals report by family, which is underneath in my financial section. Financial totals report by family. And these directions have the exact report that I'm using as well. And the first selection is looking for is families who have given more than $250. So that's just going to be this fund total section. When you're doing financial selections, almost every single selection you want is from this fund total section right here. This has all of our grand total pays. It has all of our recap pays. It has our latest pays and our first pays. And it has our average pays. Um, so the grand total pains are these ones here. So I'm saying the grand total of the date range that you've entered. The recap fields are the year to date fields. And then there's these average ones, grand total average donation per giving and grand total average donation per week. Average per giving means it takes the grand total paid and the grand total frequency and divides them. Grand total per week takes the grand total paid and divides it by the number of weeks in that period and then gives you that average. Um, so if somebody gave twice over a 10 week period, those numbers are going to be very different between them because one's going to be divided by two and one's going to be divided by 10. Um, so those are in there. First payment means the first payment made in that date range. Date range. Latest payment means the last payment made in that date range. Uh, sometimes we'll see that used when you're trying to find people who haven't given. So they'll look at the date range of, say, 2010 through 2014, and anybody whose latest payment is prior to this would be someone who hasn't given since that date. 
grand total paid includes all funds? Or? Includes whatever funds I've picked. So mm -hmm. on this screen here, I'm picking the date range and I'm picking the funds to print. So whatever date range and funds I fill in here is what that grand total is looking at. So if I fill in one day, it's the grand total for that day. If I fill in 10 years, it's the grand total for those 10 years. So it's based off of what I fill in on this funds to print screen. You wouldn't have some type of letter or something if a parishioner bounces a check. Um, there's not a standard letter that's in there, but you could certainly create a letter uh, that would just be in your letters to say, hey, your donation of, and insert that in. And actually, a good one to copy, there's a report in the tax report section that is called receipt for donation payment that actually inserts in a specific donation. And you could copy this letter. And instead of saying, thank you for your donation, <laughs> I can change my text to say, this receipt acknowledges your bounced check of whatever information. So it would just be changing the text of that. So that receipt for donation and payment would be a good one to copy and then just change the wording on it. And for whatever date range you fill in, it's going to list the payments that were made inside of there. Uh, so the grand total paid is greater than 250 would be the fund, the selection would be fund totals and grand total paid. If you notice, there's two different grand total paids. There's grand total paid and grand total total paid. Mm -hmm. The difference is that grand total paid looks just for things that have a function of payment. Grand total total paid includes payments, credits, and additional gifts. So under your fund setup, you can set up different types of donations. So there's payments, there's credits, and there's additional gifts. Grand total paid is just payments. Grand total total paid is all three. So I almost always pick grand total total paid, and that way I know I'm covering everything regardless of how it's set up. And then I would just say is greater than or equal to, and 250. If I want people with a current balance, I could say that fund totals and recap balance is greater than zero, and that's going to give me anybody whose balance as of today is greater than zero. Or if I want families who have given to a specific activity, that's that same selection we did earlier where we said that Calc Fund Act activity is equal to, and I'm picking the activity I'm looking for, and that Calc Fund Act amount is greater than zero. And so that's saying to the Ash Wednesday donation, they've given more than zero. And that's what's filling that one in there. Okay. Last little section here, and again, all of those are typed out and coming to you. This last little section, um, section nine for miscellaneous reports. Saving custom reports. So you've spent all this time, you've made your receipt or your letter about bounce checks. And it's just hanging out down here underneath your financial easy reports. Somebody else, I'm not going to say who, comes in and hits the delete button and deletes your report. And now it's gone. And you can be as angry as you would like to be at this person, but that doesn't get you your report back. You could recreate your report. The other thing we want to make sure of, though, is that you've saved backup copies of your reports. When you make a backup of your database, your reports are being backed up along with that. But the reports are being backed up with the report's file name, not this name here. So this report is actually PDS2229. And good luck remembering that when you have to go into your backup and say, I would restore just report PDS2229. So you can count on your backup to have it covering all of your reports. But if it's a report that you've specifically put time into, for example, a customized tuition statement, um, a registration form, something that's more complex, I would take the time to do the Save as Custom Report button here. Pick a spot where you're going to save your reports to. Maybe it's your Documents folder. Maybe it's the PDS folder on the server. So I usually do mine in my PDS folder just so that I know everything is together. And PDS Church. And I'm just going to say that this is my, um, not EFT. What do you call it when a check is bounced? NSF. NSF. NSF letter. 
and I'm just going to save it there, and maybe I never touch it. But if somebody else has deleted that, I can come to add and custom report, grab that NSF letter, and pull it right back in again. So it's a good idea, it takes an extra 10 seconds to save that, but you have a backup of that specific with whatever you've called it to be able to pull back in again if somebody else messes it up or if you mess it up or accidentally delete it. It's not always somebody else's fault. Uh, print to a file, we actually talked about already, so when you have a report previewed, you can tag that box for print to file and send it to a Word document or a PDF document uh, or an Excel document. And the last thing we actually talked about right at the very beginning, which is that advanced report writer guide. And again, it's under file and user guides, and it's called the advanced report guide. And it has a tutorial for getting to know the advanced report writer. So if you feel like having some fun, again, depending on your version of fun, you can go and work your way through that tutorial with the advanced report writer. Um, and if you want to play around with the advanced report writer, really great reports to practice on are the sacramental certificates. They're fairly basic, but they're kind of fun. Um, so if you come down under the member section, there's a section called certificates. And if I grab the baptismal certificate, for example, and hit copy, I can come in and play around in my sacramental certificate, and I can change fonts, and I can move things around. And it's a fairly basic report for getting used to how some of those commands and functions work and let you play around with some things inside of there. So it's just a great one to play with. So we have a couple more minutes if people have questions. So a specific report you're looking for or anything? Um, people that can view only. Okay. They went in and said you can only view mm -hmm. the information. Mm -hmm. Can they write reports? Not write reports, but make can reports. Run reports. Yes. They can run reports. Yes. Can they hit the delete button and delete reports? No. Okay. So the other thing that happened as well with version 7 is in the past the security for reports has been different than the security for the rest of the programs. So it doesn't really give you a whole lot of coverage with your reports. When they created version 7, if you have security turned on inside of the program, it set it up. And let me turn that on real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, add user. So it asks you for a username and a password when you come in. When you create a report now, it's going to have a default access. It's accessed by the report owner as a user that created it, and its default access is private. That means that only I or my username can see this report. I can change the access from private to shared, which means that other people can see it but that they can't change it, or I can set it to public, which means anybody can do anything they want to with it. <coughs> so when you have security turned on, you can set more restrictions in terms of who has access to what reports. And it's gonna work the same way with the selections that you have the ability to create a selection and say who has access to being able to modify or use that selection at all. So having security turned on in version 7 gives you more access or more restrictions to play with in terms of who's allowed to do what with reports. How do you turn security on? Uh, if you go up to set up our administration and users and passwords, you would want to fill in your usernames first. So you'd use the add user button up here. And then once you have your usernames filled in, then you can hit this button over here on the left for set security method. And you can choose either that it's asked for just a name or that it's asked for a name and a password. And you can actually do it that it's detected by Windows authentication. That means it uses your Windows username and password. So when you turn or create users and passwords up here, you would use the same one that you use on your computer when you sign into your computer. And then you won't get asked to fill in your username and password when you open up the program. It just opens up and uses that. If multiple people use the same computer, you don't want to use that option because um, it means that everybody's getting in with the same permissions automatically. So it just depends on the computer how you want to do that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Yeah. We're just starting an online gaming program. Uh huh. Is there a way to differentiate your report to use online? Okay. So depending on the type of online that you're doing, 
most people that do online now are working with a company like Banco or something like that um, to have their donations imported in from that company. So what you're doing really, you're coming to this contribution section and quick postings and do electronic transfer and it would import in all of those payments. When it does that, in the check number column, it usually fills in ACH or EFT as the check number. So you can simply go then and say, I want to look at donations or restrict out donations that have that check number or just include donations that have that check number. That's one way of doing it, and that's going to be donation by donation. Your other option is that on the family screen, uh, hold on, I didn't give myself access to funds. is when I come in here, I can just tag this box that would say electronic fund transfer for anybody who's going to have, you'd be using EFT. And then when I run my report, I could say that grant, or I think it's cap rate, uses EFT is equal to yes or is equal to no to restrict out families or not families. I could also add a family keyword of EFT to include or exclude people. The difference between using the keyword or this box versus using the check number, is that some donations you get from the same family may be EFT donations, and some may not be, depending on how you have your funds set up. So for some churches, they do all of their offering through EFT, but they do special envelopes and other collections through regular envelopes. Most churches do everything one way or the other, but not every church. So you could use either method depending on which way is going to get you the better one. So either that the check number is equal to EFT or um, that they have this EFT button checked here or they have a keyword of EFT. So it just depends on what makes the most sense for you. Other questions? After, after a person gives a donation mm -hmm. and that check comes back, is there any way you can go back to their and yep. say, you know, that... So normally what you'd want to do is in your fund, you would want to have an activity set up. There's two different types of activities that we would want. One, we would want an activity that says ISF check, and that the function of that is going to be ignore. And then we might also have an ISF check fee, which is a charge. So the one is telling it to not count that money. So if I go back to the Brennan. And this check that I got here for $250 was really the check bounced. I'm going to change my activity from being offering to being ISF check, ignore. And now all of a sudden, the amount that he's given has dropped, the grand total paid has dropped by $250. I still see this here, but it doesn't do anything with this amount. It's basically like the amount was zero. If I wanted to add in a fee, so I'm charging him for that bounce check, that's where I can then come in and say, I have an ISF check fee of $25, and now I've added $25 due to his account. Typically, for the church, we don't charge people for a bounce check. For tuition or a capital campaign, they usually do. So depending on what the fund is, uh, you may add in that charge or not in that charge. But you would want to have an activity called ISF or NSF, and it would have a function of ignore. And it's that ignore that's telling it to not count that money towards their amount paid. So I'm sorry, when you, so when you put it in, not that I have it, but mm -hmm. when you go back in to more or less zero out the yep. donation intended. Um, I don't have to change the amount. I want to leave the amount the way that it is. So that way I can see what they had actually given but it's just ignoring that donation altogether. So let me put this back to offering. I'm going to stick it at Parish Appeal. So if I look at my recap screen, I can see that he's given $2,550. Once I change that to ISF, and I look at my recap, now he's only given $2,300. So it takes that $250, it subtracts it, so I still have that line there so I can see what it was, but it doesn't do anything with that money. It doesn't include it in the total. It doesn't subtract it from the total. It just doesn't do anything. 
And it does that all that because you put ISF? Because that, that activity underneath the my fund setup, that activity has a function of ignore. So if you see how I have column here for function, most activities have a function of payment, which means it's a payment we've received. That activity I set up with a function of ignore. And that ignore function is what's telling it to ignore the donation. So it's a matter of how you have your fund set up. So you would need to have that activity, activity in every fund. Fund. Yes. So I'd want to have that in every fund that I could get or that I'm getting bounce checks for. I use that for when the parents pay the registration fee for the next year. Yes. I put it in there, but it isn't counting as mm -hmm. payment towards this year's tuition. Yeah. But then when I forward it to next year, then that $25 gets carried over. Correct. And that counts as a, as a credit. Yeah. So we'll also see that sometimes where people want to record a donation, but not count it towards everything or anything. So <laughs> people have to record or have to have given the registration fee. Um, but they don't want to actually include it in their like school tuition. They just want to have the note of when they got that in. They might set it up with a function of ignore so they can see it in there, but it doesn't count towards their tuition money. So then when they pay the $250 back, mm -hmm. then you would just go in and change it back to? I could either change that back to offering or I could just have the new activity in there so I could see that there was another one that came in um, that would be today, whatever date they gave it to me, the activity of offering in the $250. So I'd still see the bounce check. The reason we like to do it that way is if you keep getting the same bounce check or people sending them, you have a history of you've bounced 10 checks here and now you've cost me $250 and it's not worth the $10 that I've gotten from you in a donation. Uh, so you at least have that record of how many they've bounced as opposed to kind of changing it back to the actual donation. Okay. And if you charge them, you need to know what that charge is for. Yeah. So it's a good idea to keep that. Other questions? Yes. When yeah. you do the tax letter mm -hmm. at the end of the year, is there, we could put that in the fields of something that we want to say? Um, the tax letter typically is listing not activity totals. It's going to be listing... Um, group total, so it's going to say the tax letter is meant to show you how much you've actually paid. So it's not going to say you've bounced 10 checks. It's going to say some you've people paid. No, I've written this amount of checks. Yeah, so it's going to say cash. however many, however much money we've gotten in from them. It's not going to, it's not set up to include those bounced checks because that, it's not money we received. So you could theoretically, we could change the report to include that information, but typically it doesn't. Also because usually they want that letter to be more positive than uh, less positive. <laughs> so in that tax letter then, if you had the ignore, mm -hmm. and they never really made good for that 250, mm -hmm. it's not going to show up in their Correct. figures that they ever gave it. Correct. So if they gave one check and it bounced, mm -hmm. their amount paid is zero. And that's what's going to show up on their tax letter. Other questions? Who was the man that was showing up on the screen earlier? Showing up on the screen. We all saw a shadow and we're looking we at the Who walked around? Somebody. We had, they all looked. I think they were in the other room, media room behind it. Oh, I have no idea. Well, the screen was up there. I mean, you didn't know what That's what we were laughing at. There was somebody on the screen, a shadow. Yeah, I have no idea. So it was maybe the, the great and mysterious Oz. <laughs> So again, uh, this has been recording the whole thing, so we'll post those videos up. We'll send you an email once the videos are posted. But tomorrow, we'll get an email with a copy of the handout and then also a copy of the directions for all of the exercises that are inside of there. My business cards are over there, so when you have questions, give us a call, send me an email, whatever you need. We're happy to log in and walk you through whatever you want. And if there are reports that you want that you can't find in there, just send us a sample of what you'd like. We're happy to do those for you as well. Because that's something I do actually find entertaining and fun. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. If you are here for the last class, we have about five or ten minutes before that one starts. Okay. Thank you.